Welcome back to our channel, where we delve into important medical topics to enhance understanding and promote health education. Today, we're going to explore a serious medical condition known as pulmonary embolism, or PE. So let's get started. Pulmonary embolism occurs when a blood clot, often formed in the deep veins of the legs, travels to the lungs and blocks a pulmonary artery. This obstruction can disrupt blood flow, leading to potentially life-threatening consequences. In this video, we will talk briefly about the pathophysiology of pulmonary embolism, its types, diagnosis, and treatment options available. So let's start with pathophysiology. A number of elements play a role in the complicated process of blood clot development. Blood clots in the deep leg veins are frequently the site of pulmonary embolism. This could happen for a variety of causes, like prolonged immobility, an injury, or certain medical conditions that encourage blood clotting. Damage to the blood vessel's inner lining is frequently what starts the clotting process since it can expose underlying tissues and start the clotting cascade. A fibrin clot forms as a result of a number of chemical processes that make up this cascade. The fibrin clot acts like a net, capturing platelets and red blood cells to form a stable blood clot. This clot can grow in size, especially if there are abnormalities in the blood's ability to prevent excessive clotting or dissolve clots. When a blood clot develops in the deep veins, it has the potential to become dislodged and move through the bloodstream. We refer to these blood clots as emboli. A pulmonary embolism can result from an embolus that blocks one of the pulmonary arteries after it reaches the lungs. The regular blood flow to the lungs is disrupted after a pulmonary artery is blocked. As a result, the damaged pulmonary artery experiences higher pressure and impaired oxygen exchange. The body's natural response is to redirect blood flow through alternative pathways, bypassing the blocked artery. Multiple smaller vessels in the pulmonary arteries may get clogged as more blood clots build up in them, decreasing the blood flow to various parts of the lungs. Lung function may be impacted, which could have life-threatening effects. The effects of a pulmonary embolism can differ based on the size and number of emboli, as well as the person's overall health. The effects of the embolism may be reduced in some circumstances by the body's mechanisms, which may dissolve tiny clots or reroute blood flow. Larger blood clots or many clots, on the other hand, can result in more serious symptoms and challenges. These include a drop in oxygen saturation levels, hampered gas exchange, increased heart stress, and, in extreme circumstances, right-sided heart failure. Furthermore, if the blood clot does not disintegrate or is not treated quickly, it might become organized, resulting in chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. CTEPH is characterized by the formation of scar tissue within the afflicted pulmonary arteries, which results in long-term pulmonary hypertension and reduced lung function. Pulmonary embolism can be classified into different types based on the source of the blood clot and its characteristics. Let's briefly discuss the two main types. First, Thrombotic pulmonary embolism. This type occurs when a blood clot, known as a thrombus, forms within the deep veins of the legs, deep vein thrombosis or DVT, and then dislodges, traveling through the bloodstream to the lungs. Next, non-thrombotic pulmonary embolism. In this type, the embolus consists of substances other than blood clots. These substances can include fat globules from fractures or bone marrow injury air bubbles from trauma or medical procedures, amniotic fluid during childbirth, or even foreign material like tumor fragments or clumps of bacteria. Now that we've covered the types of pulmonary embolism, let's discuss the underlying pathophysiological mechanisms. Regardless of the type of pulmonary embolism, the underlying mechanism involves the obstruction of pulmonary arteries by an embolus resulting in impaired blood flow to the lungs. This obstruction triggers a series of events that can have serious consequences. Number one, hemodynamic changes. The presence of a pulmonary embolus causes an increase in pulmonary artery pressure. As a result, the right ventricle of the heart must work harder to pump blood against this increased resistance, leading to right-sided heart strain or even right-sided heart failure. Ventilation perfusion mismatch. When a pulmonary artery is blocked, the affected lung area receives less blood supply. This results in a ventilation perfusion mismatch, 
meaning that air and blood flow within the lung are not optimally matched. As a result, impaired gas exchange occurs, leading to decreased oxygenation of the blood and subsequent hypoxemia. Inflammatory response. The presence of a pulmonary embolus triggers an inflammatory response within the affected pulmonary arteries. This inflammatory process can further contribute to the narrowing of the blood vessels and exacerbate the obstruction. And lastly, pulmonary vasoconstriction. The obstruction caused by the embolus can lead to localized vasoconstriction in the pulmonary arteries. This response serves as a protective mechanism to redirect blood flow to healthier areas of the lungs. However, excessive vasoconstriction can further increase pulmonary artery pressure and worsen the hemodynamic consequences. These pathophysiological mechanisms collectively contribute to the clinical manifestations and potential complications associated with pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism is a potentially fatal illness that must be treated as soon as possible. Healthcare providers in the ER are trained to recognize specific signs and symptoms that may suggest the presence of PE. The most common presenting symptom of pulmonary embolism is sudden onset of dyspnea or shortness of breath. Patients often describe it as feeling like they can't catch their breath or experiencing unexplained breathing difficulties. Patients with pulmonary embolism may suffer chest discomfort in addition to dyspnea. The level of this pain varies and might be acute or stabbing. It should be noted that chest pain and PE might mimic other medical conditions such as a heart attack. Thus, a comprehensive evaluation is required. While dyspnea and chest pain are key symptoms, Pulmonary embolism can present with a variety of other clinical features. Let's take a closer look at some of them. Tachycardia, a rapid heartbeat or tachycardia, is a common finding in patients with PEA. The body's response to decreased oxygenation and increased strain on the heart leads to an elevated heart rate. Hypoxemia, pulmonary embolism, impairs oxygen exchange in the lungs, leading to decreased oxygen saturation levels in the blood. This results in hypoxemia, which can be detected using pulse oximetry. Cough and hemoptesis. Some patients with pulmonary embolism may develop a cough, which can be dry or associated with blood-tinged sputum, known as hemoptesis. This occurs due to irritation of the lung tissues or small pulmonary infarctions. When a pulmonary embolism suspicion emerges in the ER, Healthcare workers employ a variety of techniques and examinations to categorize individuals into distinct risk groups. This aids in treatment decision-making and determining the right degree of care. Risk stratification tools, such as the Pulmonary Embolism Severity Index, PESI, or the Simplified Revised Geneva Score, take into account factors such as age, vital signs, oxygen levels, and the presence of comorbidities to classify patients as low, intermediate, or high risk. The diagnosis of pulmonary embolism begins with a thorough clinical examination. Healthcare providers in the emergency room or outpatient settings will collect information regarding the patient's medical history, symptoms, and any risk factors that may increase the lehood of PA. Key symptoms that raise suspicion for pulmonary embolism include sudden onset dyspnea, chest pain, cough, and hemoptysis. It's important to remember that these symptoms can be nonspecific and may resemble other conditions, so further diagnostic tests are necessary for confirmation. Computed tomography pulmonary angiography, CTPA, is considered the gold standard for diagnosing pulmonary embolism. It involves injecting a contrast dye into the patient's veins and then performing a CT scan to visualize the pulmonary arteries. The dye helps identify any blood clots or blockages in the pulmonary vasculature. CTPA is highly sensitive and specific for detecting pulmonary embolism. It provides detailed images of the pulmonary vasculature and can help determine the location and extent of the blood clot. In addition to imaging, a blood test called the D-dimer test is often used as a screening tool for pulmonary embolism. D-dimer is a protein fragment released into the bloodstream when a blood clot breaks down. A negative D-dimer test result can be helpful in ruling out pulmonary embolism in patients with a low pretest probability. However, it is important to note that a positive result does not confirm the diagnosis and further imaging is needed for definitive evaluation. 
The D-dimer test is particularly useful in combination with clinical assessment and risk stratification to help guide the decision for further diagnostic testing. When a patient is diagnosed with pulmonary embolism, immediate management is crucial to prevent further complications and reduce the risk of mortality. The primary goals of treatment are to stabilize the patient, dissolve or remove the blood clot, and prevent future embolic events. Let's take a deeper look at the various treatment methods that are routinely used. First, anticoagulation therapy. Anticoagulation therapy is the cornerstone of treatment for pulmonary embolism. It involves the administration of medications that prevent the formation of new blood clots and aid in the breakdown of existing clots. The specific medication and dosage will depend on the severity of the condition and individual patient factors. The most commonly used anticoagulants include Purin, heparin, is usually given intravenously or subcutaneously and acts quickly to prevent clot formation. It is often used initially in the acute setting of pulmonary embolism. Low molecular weight heparin, LMWH, such as enoxaparin, is another commonly used anticoagulant. It has a more predictable anticoagulant effect and can be administered subcutaneously. And, Direct oral anticoagulants, DOKs, such as rivaroxaban or apixaban, are newer oral medications that have gained popularity in recent years. They offer convenience with fixed dosing and regular blood monitoring is not required. Anticoagulation therapy is typically continued for a period of time, often several months, to prevent recurrent blood clots. The duration of therapy depends on the underlying cause of the pulmonary embolism and individual patient factors. In certain cases of pulmonary embolism, additional treatment options may be considered. These include, like thrombolytic therapy. Thrombolytic therapy involves the use of medications, such as altaplase or tenecteplase, to rapidly dissolve blood clots. This treatment is reserved for patients with severe or high-risk pulmonary embolism as it carries a higher risk of bleeding complications. Next one is most important, inferior vena cava or IVC filter placement. In some situations, when anticoagulation therapy is contraindicated or insufficient, an IVC filter may be inserted. This device is placed in the inferior vena cava, a large vein that returns blood from the lower body to the heart to prevent blood clots from traveling to the lungs. And lastly, surgical embolectomy. Surgical embolectomy involves the removal of the blood clot through a surgical procedure. It is typically reserved for patients with massive or life-threatening pulmonary embolism who do not respond to other treatment options. These additional treatment options are considered in specific cases where the risk-benefit ratio is carefully assessed by the healthcare team. After the acute treatment phase, long-term management and prevention of recurrent pulmonary embolism are important. This may involve continued anticoagulation therapy or, in some cases, the use of compression stockings to promote blood flow in the lower extremities. Lifestyle modifications, such as regular exercise, maintaining a healthy weight, and avoiding prolonged periods of inactivity can also help reduce the risk of blood clot formation. It's crucial for patients with pulmonary embolism to follow up with their healthcare providers regularly to monitor their condition adjust medication dosages if necessary, and address any concerns or new symptoms that may arise. That's all for today's video on the treatment of pulmonary embolism. If you found this information helpful, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more educational content. Stay healthy, and we'll see you in the next video.